Welcome and thank you for joining us for the Hawkeyes Give Back Com Combating Climate Change. My name is Lucas DeWitt and I serve as the president of the Student Advancement Network. University of Iowa students who join the Student Advancement Network serve as selected representatives of the student body to network with University of Iowa alumni and donors. We also educate our peers about the importance of philanthropy and engagement, their different forms, and how they can give back as Hawkeyes. Now, before we get started, I do have a few technical items to note. Participant microphones are automatically muted and videos are automatically off. But we would love to hear from you um, in the chat. We encourage you to use the Q&A feature to share any questions that you may have for the panelists. You can access the Q&A feature by clicking the Q&A icon and type in a question into the box. Questions will be monitored throughout the event, so you may submit questions on an ongoing basis and they will be covered during our Q&A session toward the end of the hour. Now, to get started with our event, it is my privilege to invite the University of Iowa President, Bruce Harold to share remarks. Thank you, Lucas. I just uh, learned a few minutes ago that you'll be graduating in a few weeks, so let me be the first to congratulate you for all that you've done, and good luck, and, and make sure you come back. Uh, and, and thank all of you for joining this very important session on uh, entitled Hawkeyes Give Back, Combating Climate Change. Uh, we all got to answer that trick question right at the beginning, which is how do we define philanthropy? And so many of us think of it just as fundraising. And the point of that question was to remind us all, and I think 89% is what I saw of you, got it right. It's, it's everything you can imagine. It's about interacting, it's giving our time, volunteering. It's also about sharing advice and mentoring. You're gonna see a fair amount of that today from two very well-established colleagues. And it's and, and then of course it is about treasure and giving giving back. Those are all very, very important. And I think these types of sessions remind us of the importance of coming together to, to have a, a rational conversation about one of the most important topics of our times. Somehow we've managed to politicize this whole very important issue. And I hope if nothing else, we can get to some of the concrete issues and facts that we're facing. It's probably the most important issue facing uh, Lucas's generation. And we, it's time we actually deal with it very quickly and, and forcefully. The two of our experts today, uh, Greg Carmichael and Jerry Schnorr are two of our best. And they've given a lot of their time, not only to these types of sessions, but also in terms of a lot of other committees on campus. And I'd like to really thank them. And hopefully we're all gonna get something out of this. And thank you once again for all of you coming to join us today. With that, Lucas, let me turn it back to you. Thank you again and congratulations. Thank you, President Harold. I appreciate that. Uh, so this afternoon, we are here to celebrate two Hawkeyes who are giving back and learn how they are using philanthropy to combat climate change. Uh, it's something that is very more impactful, more so impactful now, knowing that they are professors here at the University of Iowa. Uh, Dr. Gregory Carmichael is a professor of chemical and biochemical engineering in the College of Engineering and has done extensive research related to air quality and its environmental impacts. He is a leader in the development and application of chemical transport models to studies in regional at atmospheric chemistry, air quality, and climate. Carmichael's research has led to a greater appreciation and understanding of importance of long-range transport of pollutants within Asia and across the Pacific. He also serves as the chair of the scientific advisory group for the World Meteorological Organization Global Atmospheric Watch Urban Meteorology and Environmental Project, which is focused on building capacity worldwide to improve air quality forecasts and related services. And second, we have Dr. Gerald Schnorr, who is a professor of civil and environmental engineering in the College of Engineering and a professor of occupational and environmental health in the College of Public Health. He's also a member of the U United States National Academy of Engineering for his pioneering work using mathematical models in science policy decisions. He has testified several times before Congress on environmental protection, including the importance of passing the 1990 Clean Air Act. Professor Carmichael and Professor Schnoor are also co-founders and co-directors of the University of Iowa-based Center for Global and Regional Environmental Research. Now, moderating our conversation today, this afternoon, is going to be Lynette Marshall, who is the president and CEO of the University of Iowa Center for Advancement. Lynette, the floor is yours. I'm excited to hear what we all, what they have to say today. 
I am too. Thank you so much, Lucas. It's become a tradition for us each semester to gather and to celebrate Hawkeyes who give back. Um, people who give back to Iowa and to their communities. And while I wish that we could be together in person today, it was still important to us to be able to gather virtually um, to continue an important conversation about the many ways that we can make differences in our lives. Our university has a long tradition of excellence in education and research and patient care. And that's fueled by the generosity of many people and while it's easy to recognize philanthropy if you see it in buildings or campus monuments, our alumni and friends and donors make a difference in many ways by offering support for our faculty like Professor Schnorr and Professor Carmichael, supporting cutting edge research, edit, cutting edge research and sharing their expertise in the classroom. We know that philanthropy in all of its forms is a powerful tool for leveraging change. And that's true both on campus and around the world. So that's why I'm especially grateful to Professor Schnorr and Professor Carmichael. So we're going to get started with some questions for them. Um, so thank you both very much for joining us today. Since many of the folks who are with us may not know your own personal stories, I thought it would be nice to start with each of you sharing a little bit about your own background and what sparked your own interest in environmental research and climate change. And could we start with you, Professor Schnorr? Sure, thanks, Lena. Well, I guess it goes back to, uh, I'm an Iowa boy, uh, Davenport Central, and I loved chemistry. And uh, I went to the other school, Iowa State University, in chemical engineering, as did Greg, my colleague. Uh, and uh, there I figured out that, um, when Earth Day came, the first one, 1970, not the one last week, but the very first one in 1970, I thought, well, gee, this chemical engineering stuff maybe could be applied to understand better the environment. And I think that's really what got me going. I was able to get advanced degrees in uh, environmental health engineering and environmental engineering and ended up becoming a professor. My dad only got to eighth grade. So I didn't have very much uh, uh, advice. I was the first one to go to school, but I always thought if I could just get a bachelor's degree, that would be super. Then if I can get a master's degree, wow, that's gravy. And uh, finally, my professor said I should get a PhD, and, and I did that. And uh, I've enjoyed teaching at the University of Iowa since 1977. So this is my 44th year of teaching. <laughs> what a great career you've had. Thank you so much. Professor Carmichael, how about you? What was your path to this? Yeah, it's uh, actually pretty similar. I grew up in uh, uh, Northern Illinois, small town, Marengo, Illinois. I didn't have any uh, engineering uh, mentors or anybody in the family, uh, but it, the same sort of story. You know, when I was I graduated in high school in 1970, there was a the time of a lot of student protest of the war that kind of migrated on to the environment. Uh, and, and I too looked at and said, well, most of our environmental problems are chemically related. And so I chose chemical engineering as uh, the entryway into that with the notion that, uh, you know, if we can make chemicals without any waste, you know, then that would be the, a big contribution and solution. So I went in, uh, that's how I got into this. And then I went on to the graduate school. And at that time was when we were first understanding that, that we, the humans, how we kind of lived our lives could impact larger, the, an area larger than the urban environment. And at that time, you may recall some of you and the students may, there was a problem called acid rain, which really told us that what happened, you know, uh, here could impact lakes and, and, and trees and vegetation thousands of kilometers away. And, and so I, I got into looking at it from a little bit bigger perspective. <laughs> um, well, th speaking of a bigger perspective, the two of you together co-founded the Center for Global and Environmental Research. And so it took you far away from um, Marengo or uh, to be, uh, Davenport, I guess you said, 
Um, and, and so the center that you founded is now celebrated its 30th anniversary. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the impetus for establishing that and then how it's contributed to, to the opportunity for you to do your work at Iowa. Okay, uh, Jerry, I'll, I'll start. Um, yeah, so we look at the, the, the Center for Global and Regional Environmental Research is really a unique center. I think I've never seen anything like it, certainly in the United States or anywhere. It, it, it really began as a grassroots effort and it's, we formalized in 1990 uh, but the roots of it began a few years before that when, you know, in the 1980s, we were just beginning to think about a global warming. And there was beginning to be some uh, studies being conducted about the potential of global warming. And then in 1988, Jim Hansen, a Denison, Iowa, a three-time grad from uh, University of Iowa, uh, testified for Congress uh, about the, the human impact of global warming and uh, projections of what that might mean moving forward and called for uh, uh, the need to act now. And so Jerry and I and a handful of others got together. Um, you know, we don't have any atmospheric science department here. We just got together out of mutual interest to see, you know, what could we do with this? And we were encouraged by the administration at that point in time, there was a leadership seminar out at Oakdale campus about emerging topics and a group of us made that and and then that got the start going and then I think Jerry can pick up and, and take it uh, and say something about where we went from there. Well, as Greg said, it really was a grassroots effort. It was geography, geology, chemistry, biology, engineering, and uh, the health sciences, too, were intimately involved uh, back then. But we did owe a, a debt of gratitude to the state legislature at the time and the governor's office uh, in creating the Iowa Energy Act of 1990. And they uh, funded the center at that time uh, in a novel way by uh, using a tax, kind of the polluter pays principle, uh, tax on uh, investor owned utilities uh, initially. And uh, that tax one tenth of 1% of the gross operating revenues went to the Iowa Energy Center, 85% of it at Iowa State. And then they thought, well, maybe we should have somebody looking at the implications of all this energy and that was uh, the 15 percent of the tax which went to University of Iowa to found the uh, Center for Global and Regional Environmental Research. And uh, we've enjoyed that state support through the ratepayers and the utilities all along 30 years as you said Lynette and uh, now Unfortunately, it's actually coming to a close. We're due to sunset in uh, 2022. Thank you for the um, background on that. That's really interesting. Um, if we turn to your individual work and the research that each of you have done, Professor Carmichael, your research has been in air quality and its environmental impacts. And I know that's been global. Um, with a reduction of travel over the past year that's impacted all of us, what impact do you think the pandemic has had on air quality and what lessons might we be able to carry forward? Yeah, thanks, uh, Lynette. I mean, the, you know, the pandemic has been really a truly uh, catastrophe and impacted us and everybody around the world in so many different ways. But from an air pollution perspective, it's been this uh, experiment of opportunity. And so as scientists, you know, we really want to understand uh, uh, kind of the implications of what COVID did and, and the reduced you know, mo mobility of people. I'm showing some slides here uh, and we now have from space a really incredible capability of monitoring certain pollutants from space. And I think on the upper right, you'll see a satellite imagery of um, uh, NO2, nitrogen dioxide, which comes from all sorts of combustions, largely transportation. And so you see a map of China you see it in early January of 2020. Uh, and then uh, if you see the next in February after the lockdown, you see uh, very dramatically how NO2 emissions have been reduced significantly. 
And here, I think the, the, the important lesson is that, you know, we, by our actions, we can uh, reduce emissions uh, in many ways. And this is really represents largely the transportation sector. And so we are doing studies now to, this is something that we could sustain if we more rapidly transition to electrified vehicles, for example. And so the lesson is, you know, the cause of why we got this big uh, improvement isn't how we want to get there. But on the other hand, we know what the environment would look like. And there are many, many pictures of where you hadn't seen the horizon in so many years. And now you see these beautiful pictures. Down below on the other side, so that's not just an air pollution, but relevant to climate, you know, CO2 is our uh, most important greenhouse gas. And this shows now measurements from uh, uh, near the surface of different cities. I'm just showing representatives here. But the red is uh, the CO2 fluxes or emissions from the cities uh, during the COVID uh, lockdown period. And again, you see tremendous reductions of CO2. And, and during the lockdown periods, we reduced CO2 by about 20%. And that, you know, just think about, you know, Biden wants us to reduce uh, by 50% by 2030, well, you know, if, if we could sustain something like this, uh, it shows you the sorts of efforts and the responses. Um, so, you know, those are sort of, sort of the lessons is uh, we, we do control uh, our air pollution, we do control our greenhouse gas emissions, and, and this is a, a good demonstration. So I hope we learn this moving forward. And the other thing that we're learning is, you know, with the big, uh, uh, investments in recovery, we hope that uh, those investments can go into sustaining some of these things, greening our, making our cities more resilient and sustainable, giving uh, better jobs, uh, uh, investing in, in reducing the inequalities of what air pollution and climate change uh, uh, put on us. So I think there's, and the final lesson that we learn in, in is that, you know, we really need to listen to the science you know, and, you know, and that's how we're going to get out of the COVID. Uh, uh, and that's how we're going to get out and, and uh, hopefully avoid the most dangerous uh, uh, responses to a changing climate. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks for sharing that slide. That's really a powerful image of the difference um, in just a month. Yeah, very interesting. Um, Professor Schnorr, back in 2015, you traveled with a group of students to the United Nations Climate Change Conference. What a remarkable experience that must have been for those students. And the conference was the one that resulted in the Paris Climate Agreement, which I'm pleased to say the United States recently rejoined. Tell us a little bit about that experience that you and the students had. Well, thanks, Lynette. Actually, it goes back to uh, for me, 1992, the uh, Rio Earth Summit, we took uh, more than a dozen, I think 14 students under the auspices of the United Nations Association. The students were given uh, NGO delegate uh, status. And uh, we began uh, at the very beginning of the climate convention in 1992 and followed by 2002, the World Summit on Sustainable Development in Rio de Janeiro. There were Hawkeyes there, uh, followed by 2009, the Copenhagen uh, Climate Conference. Lots of Hawkeyes there, students again through the United Nations Summit. And, and uh, the Paris Agreement, though, I must say, was some kind of a, uh, a, um, a, a high compared to the other uh, meetings because it was difficult to get all the countries to agree. Every country in the world, 195 countries agreed for the first time that climate change is a very serious issue and that we need, need to all do something about it. And uh, that was remarkable to get anybody, all the countries to agree. Uh, it's about like getting all the faculty at the University of Iowa to agree on something. It's not very easy. And so, uh, I felt a sense of triumph at the end of that meeting, even though it, there's no real teeth in it. I mean, it's based on volunteerism and what we call soft law. And in a way, um, countries wanting to do the right thing and maybe a little bit uh, peer pressure or shaming 
uh, if you don't do the right thing. But again, we had students shown here, uh, journalism and communication students. Our, our center, Seeger, has done a great job with Joe Bolcom as our education and outreach director, uh, working with um, students, especially uh, journalism students, but also different science students in liberal arts on telling our story. And uh, Nick Fetty and Casey McGinnis uh, were two who uh, went with us to the uh, Paris Agreement in 2015, and they covered it very well. We had blogs. I myself was a uh, delegate for chemical engineering news. I was writing a daily blog and also articles for um, the American Chemical Society chemical engineering news. So it was very exciting in, in uh, Paris uh, that we had at least the beginning of an agreement that where everyone was involved. You mentioned um, Dr. Hansen earlier being involved. I'm wondering about some of the uh, students that you have mentored and had as part of your research programs over the years that are currently still engaged as leaders in this area. Anybody in particular uh, come to mind for you? Well, uh, Greg and I, once again, we're good uh, compadres. Uh, we shared a student, Greg, I was on this committee and Greg was the chair of Marcelo Mena uh, at Iowa. Um, maybe it's the next slide, Marcelo. No, here he is, thank you. The lower right here shows Marcelo uh, as the, he rose to uh, become first a professor and then eventually Minister of the Environment in Chile, and finally an advisor to the World Bank on, uh, the, Par on the Paris Agreement, among other things. And the shot in the lower right is me with Marcelo in 2015 at Paris. He was the lead delegate, the head of the delegation uh, for all of Chile as a result of being the minister. And, you know, he's one of ours. He's one of our uh, graduates, another Hawkeye uh, making good. He's made a big difference, uh, not only in Chile, but in Latin America and, yes, uh, even at the World Bank. In the upper uh, right-hand corner of this slide is one of my uh, students, Forrest Meggers. Uh, Forrest is from Solon, Iowa, if you can imagine. He grew up on a, sort of a small farm uh, in Solon, Iowa. I've had several PhD students from Solon, Iowa doing amazing things. And uh, Forrest uh, graduated from here with a master's. He was always interested in addition to uh, engineering, environmental engineering, mechanical engineering. He was always interested in architecture as well. He built all his own bicycles, designed all his own bicycles, uh, uh, had um, uh, an interest in extra cycles, which means cycles that you can carry all your luggage on and still have a bicycle. And so I sent him to the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology for his PhD, because they were doing some of the most interesting things in sustainability at the time. Uh, from there, he um, immediately made a name for himself. He's now uh, an assistant professor at uh, Princeton University uh, and the Andlinger Center for Energy. He had this cool idea shown in the far extreme upper right idea that uh, you don't need to use as much energy if people in their buildings feel warm. And he figured out that they feel warm if there's a lot of radiative transfer uh, from, for example, uh, the walls or other materials. And so he's experimented with this and made quite a name for himself. You end up using less energy, emitting less greenhouse gases, yet people feel better at a, at a, lower, at a lower temperature. So there are just a couple of uh, them. Uh, uh, one of our PhD students, Craig Just, uh, uh, who worked with me, has it's a it's a sterling case of the student far surpassing the professor. I'll tell you that uh, he is uh, such a neat Hawkeye. Uh, got his PhD in two thousand and one, and has uh, always felt strongly about using his chemistry and engineering background to uh, help other people. And uh, so he's taken our students uh, and instilled in them, actually the students already have it, they, they get it, 
that we're a part. Uh, climate change involves everybody, just like COVID-19. Everybody has to be involved with the uh, solution. Uh, Craig gets it, and so do his students. And you can see in the extreme upper right hand of this slide, uh, a group of our students from University of Iowa in Ghana uh, with uh, drinking water supplies, um, uh, safe drinking water supplies. And uh, the one in the upper left is um, May, uh, Megan Lindstrom. She's uh, one of Craig's students now, so my granddaughter, I guess you would say. Uh, and uh, they're in Nicaragua also working on uh, chlorinating uh, drinking water supplies that were causing lots of disease and, and illness uh, in Nicaragua. In the bottom right is one of my current PhD students who's just graduated, uh, taking her exam this semester, Hannah Molitor. She's originally from very small town, uh, Prairie du Sac in, uh, in Wisconsin. She went to Platteville, University of Wisconsin. We attracted her here. And we, she's taken uh, um, simulated uh, power plant gas from our power plant here at the University of Iowa and bubbled that through al algal um, cultures and they, the algae clean up the pollutant and actually it benefits them in terms of settling it out. And uh, they're very nutritious, uh, these particular algae that Hannah grows. She's made me cookies from them and I ate them and I'm still here. So it must be okay. Uh, and uh, this uh, algae we feed to um, cattle, mainly cattle, and it replaces soy protein. So it frees the land up to make more food while we use a waste to create a beneficial product uh, for animal feed and to help feed the world. It could be uh, food for, for people as well. That so, sounds like a good cycle to get started. That's great. Those are just a few of the, uh, you can maybe tell I'm really proud of all the students we've had here. Anybody you want to add to Professor Carmichael? Uh, no, I, no, but yeah, I mean, we've had a good group of students and I think that uh, the Center for Global and Regional Environmental Research has really helped to nurture that, uh, the spirit of uh, sustainability and uh, Jerry didn't mention, but the couple of the students he mentioned were really, they were really at the beginning of pushing the University of Iowa into its uh, current sustainability track, uh, Marcello and, and Menger and, uh, and others. But yeah, so I mean, really, it's in many, many ways, as Jerry said, I mean, we're here, but we're motivated by the students you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and inspired by the students. Yeah. Speaking of students, um, Professor Schnorr, back in 2010, you won the very prestigious Clark Prize, which recognizes research accomplishments that solve real world water problems. And that prize came with a $50,000 award, which you very generously then donated to student service groups in the College of Engineering. I'm interested in what inspired you to do that. To be honest, Linda, I couldn't think of anything better to do uh, with the money. I didn't need it. It was completely a surprise uh, and, um, and an honor to get such an uh, award as that. And I thought about uh, how did I do it, and really it was uh, by having students like these in this particular uh, slide showing now. They're the ones who do all the work. I'm not in the lab anymore. How did I get that prize from the students? So, and then when you have uh, faculty like uh, Craig Just and students like the ones that we've been discussing, Greg and I, uh, it was an easy uh, connect the, the dots to figure out that I should give that money to the student groups. And, and I've continued to go. So it's, it's actually fun. I believe in uh, philanthropy. And I've continued to give to Engineers Without uh, Borders at, at the University of Iowa with uh, also our um, Engineers for a Sustainable World and several student groups. We have a bridge crossing group. All of them are dedicated to giving back. And, and, and as President Harold said at the outset, it's not only uh, treasure, it's not only money, though that's important, but it's also giving back of your time and once again, the, the students get it and and they're doing it. So that's why I was inspired to do that. 
Well, and I know that you inspired others to do something similar as well. So thank you for um, what you did and for what you made possible with those gifts. I'm interested, um, perhaps Professor Carmichael, if you have uh, any uh, anything you can offer to us about how generous Hawkeyes have supported your own work throughout your career. Yeah, I think it's been, uh, you know, certainly given the opportunities to to you know further uh, develop my my activities, and certainly the university has been uh, very uh, open and supportive of what I've done. And a lot of what I do from the service perspective, I do a lot of work for the UN, the United Nations, uh, and specifically with the World Meteorological Organization. Uh, I've been working with them for about 30 years. And for the last eight years, I serve as the chair of their scientific steering committee. Um, and what they do, um, a good example of what we do in this program that we're responsible for coordinating, operating the uh, global network of uh, observatories for measuring carbon dioxide. You can see the map down below. Um, and with that data then, uh, we analyze it each year and, and put out the uh, uh, WMO Greenhouse Gas Bulletin, for example, which uh, is kind of the authoritative version on an annual basis that tells us where we are in terms of our, our greenhouse gas uh, uh, concentrations in the atmosphere. And I'm showing you a figure here that um, shows you observations from 1985, but they actually, real measurements of CO2 go back to 1958. And you can see that they, we've been generally rising. If you go back um, a thousand years and from a thousand years to about 1800, we were at about 285 parts per billion of uh, parts per million of CO2. And now you can see where um, starting with uh, really in the uh, 1950s, we really started to take off uh, as our economies expanded worldwide. And you can see the, the CO2 levels growing there. These are based on, again, our measurements that are needed uh, to have an accurate representation. I give you the global mean uh, temperature, of take, you know, the annual global mean temperature, uh, uh, CO2 levels are now about 409 parts per million. And we're pretty soon going to go, um, this year, the global average will, will come up to be 410. And that'll be, a, you'll see a lot in the news about that. It's, a, it's not a place we wanna be. But again, um, this is what's really necessary to track what we're doing to the environment. And this is what's driving uh, climate change. The insert picture here, if you go back, please. The insert picture here is really important because it shows uh, if we keep growing like this, uh, we're, we will experience the sorts of uh, really um, dangerous uh, climate tipping points that uh, we've all heard about uh, and don't wanna go there. And what we need to do is bend that curve and we need to bend that curve as soon as possible as this diagram shows. Uh, this number of 450, our goal is to keep CO2 in the atmosphere below that number. And this diagram shows that in order to do that, we have to decrease emissions right away and in a big manner. And uh, this ties to what uh, President Biden just announced uh, you know, to reduce this by 50% by 2030. And if you look carefully at this, that's really what we need to, to get on that path. It won't be easy, uh, but it's necessary. And this, this plot also shows you if you go, if we don't do it right away, then pretty quickly you're committed to, you know, 550 parts per million of CO2 and you're, you're committed to uh, changes in the climate that, that, that we don't want to, experience and certainly the generations of our graduating uh, undergraduates uh, are going to have to deal with that mess for you know for for their lifetime and so you know it's really important and so again these measurements are are really critical to understanding where we're going and also understanding when we take positive actions how how quickly we can bend the curve and then the next slide will just, again, we're, I'm not only kind of overseeing this global program in, in terms of scientific advisory, but we also are part of taking observations. So if you see, if you go to West Branch, you'll see a tall radio tower there. 
And that radio tower is actually a ta is been instrumented with uh, capabilities of measuring uh, uh, greenhouse gases. So Charlie Stanier in chemical engineering, uh, the faculty members supervise that for, for the uh, National Oceanographic and Aeronautic Association administration. But um, we actively engage research, uh, researchers and undergraduates. So you see Nathan Mesa here is uh, uh, an undergraduate who's going to the station and helping uh, maintain the measurements. Um, and so again, it's uh, not only from the, the biggest picture of all, but also uh, right in our backyard of taking the measurements that are needed to, to really uh, understand and then address uh, climate change. We've had a question that I think is related to this, um, Professor Carmichael, uh, and the question from our audience is, uh, says energy production is the second highest greenhouse gas source in the U.S. If we increase EV use, do you have suggestions on best practices for energy production to mitigate the increased energy needs? Well, I mean, I think that in order to get the curve bent the way we need to, you know, I think a big step is the need to electrify everything and to electrify and to get that electric, electricity from uh, sustainable, from, from wind and, and uh, solar. Um, and so I think that's a big step, you know, and then that's not the only step, but that's, that's needed. And certainly we're transitioning there quickly, but, you know, but it is going to, you know, it will, uh, to bend the curve way we want to it, it's going to affect all the different sectors you know, in, in Iowa, we have to think about, you know, food production um, and how can we, uh, you know, decarbonize the, the, the food production as another example. So. Mm -hmm. Another question from the audience is, um, it says climate change has been described as a wicked problem. Mm -hmm. How do we make a difference when we are facing such a complex and systemic challenge? I think I'll, uh, I'll I'll let Jerry take this first because uh, you know I, I he did a at Earth Day uh, we have to vision you know really imagine and visionize what uh, what it's going to take to get there and and at one hand I'm I'm one that says uh, the time you know repeating or paraphrasing what Greta said you know the the time for small steps is over and we really need to uh, you know everybody's got to get on board and do everything we can and take the, the, the difficult decisions. But on the other hand, uh, we have to do everything if we're going to bend the curve. And I think Jerry can ar articulate that uh, and give his thoughts on that. So, Well, I, I, I did give an Earth Day talk that Greg was talking about, and I asked the audience to imagine what life would be like in 2070 if we actually achieve the goals of uh, the Paris Con Climate uh, Agreement and assuming that they're now going to become um, what President Biden said, a 50% decline in emissions by 2030. That's a tall order. And uh, net zero, we'll still have some emissions, but we have to also remove uh, greenhouse gases from the atmosphere by 2050. That's a really big uh, challenge. And I point out it's bigger than uh, uh, President Kennedy's speech in 1962. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to uh, ca tackle climate change because we must. And uh, the, some of the uh, actions, as Greg alluded, uh, include uh, massive reforestation. That's nature's way of taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. We can do it. We've got the marginal lands all over the world uh, to do it, including uh, Iowa was once 25% uh, forested. For Iowa, it means uh, regenerative agriculture. We need to figure out, we've lost about half of our topsoil, a little bit more than half our topsoil and our organic carbon. We need to start to rotate crops, have cover crops, um, uh, begin to uh, uh, preserve the land from erosion, no tillage, and to put carbon back into the soil. And I think uh, farmers will be paid uh, for in, in order to do that. We need to create a circular economy. We can't have uh, electric vehicles if we don't know how to recycle their batteries. As Greg said, we're gonna electrify almost everything. 
Um, and when we electrify almost everything, that means that you have to do it from low carbon sources, wind, solar. But to move all those electrons around, we're going to have to have a better grid. It's going to create millions and millions of jobs because uh, just to winterize our homes, we, Iowa has one of the oldest housing stocks in the United States, and we need the, the average uh, building is 40 or 50 years old. We need to employ people to weatherize everything, uh, witness what happened in Texas this uh, winter. Uh, and so we have lots of solutions, but we need to also send a price signal, I think, into the marketplace that it's going to become very uh, um, expensive to use fossil fuels and the price has to go up and thus um, wind, solar, and renewables will become cheaper and cheaper through economies of scale. They, they have already. In fact, it's cheaper to build uh, solar and wind right now uh, than a coal-fired power plant or even a natural gas plant. I was interested to see the um, recent news about Iowa City adding quite a few solar panels to um, <laughs> our community as well. That's that's great. Yeah. Um, another audience question, uh, how do we move away from the binary of individual action versus system change as we frame the conversation about uh, climate change? Well, I think that if they're alluding to it's, I think it's uh, organizationally as well. I mean, it starts, it's from the local, I think the university is a big role model and, 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 you know, they can be, and we can be uh, among the first to get to zero net carbon. Um, and then, you know, as you said, city, the states, uh, politically, of course, we, uh, we have to get on board to have the right policies in place. Uh, um, and we, and it needs to be international. So, I mean, it's a, it's a tall order, but we also see that things are, are uh, lining up. Um, and I also think that people are understanding better the costs of climate change. You know, it's not something out in the future. I think uh, yesterday in the New York Times talked about, you know, the under climate scenarios that you're looking at many countries that would uh, be reducing their their uh, GDP by up to 20%. Um, you know, so these are huge numbers and, and so, the alternative of stopping climate change and the benefits are coming from it are, I think are becoming realized. And even from a, coming back to the COVID and the health perspective, I think more and more evidence is saying that, uh, that having a stable climate is, is a prerequisite for our health uh, individually and, and, and globally. So, you know, so, but I think again, not just in terms of action, I think in, in terms of, people's willingness to participate in organizational change is needed, so. Mm -hmm. uh, another question that has come in, is there any compromise that you think the government can make with the oil industry to actually help make change happen? Do you think a carbon tax or any other solution might help the oil industry not completely oppose regulation going forward? I think the oil industry has to be uh, employed in uh, plugging wells and um, disassembling the uh, infrastructure, uh, but they they can play a role with the expertise that has already been gained uh, in things like transitioning the uh, natural gas pipelines to hydrogen pipelines. Mm -hmm. be uh, retrofitted to become hydrogen uh, pipelines. They can also, of course, due to the mechanical skills of the oil and gas industry, which is substantial, more than half a million jobs we're talking about, uh, they can be employed to uh, make new solar uh, farms, uh, make new um, concentrated solar uh, panels, uh, wind turbines, and so on. And there is going to have to be a transition, and hopefully government can, can help with that uh, transition. And I would just Good. add, um, you know, I serve as a, a, on a policy committee for the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, which really represents a lot of the uh, oil and, and chemical industry. And we worked together just recently to put out a, a, a very positive uh, organizational statement on climate change. And my, 
my my sense is there's been a transition. These companies know what the future is uh, and how they are going to, you know, make returns to their stakeholders and, and business moving forward. And in and, and many, in most cases, they've really positioned themselves already uh, to do that. But what they're doing in, is, you know, they're trying to not be told what to do. And so they've been, you know, kind of pushing back on any regulation. But I think as soon as regulation happens, they're prepared to move forward in most cases. So I think, again, it's this um, little bit of playing a game. And once we come around and actually set the rules, um, I think I'm actually more optimistic that they're going to be able to transition and they know what they're going to do um, in many cases. I think it's the smaller companies that are going to be the more reluctant uh, and more difficult to, to, to make the changes. Very interesting. Our final question from the audience um, is that uh, we do have some clean hydrogen research happening at the University of Iowa. Do you think that technology from that research could help bend the curve um, related to transportation and energy production? Well, uh, I'll try, uh, Greg, to take it first, but the hydrogen uh, economy, as it's called, is a, is a real promise out there, but I don't think it's going to help us with our 10-year uh, goal to have a 50% reduction in, in emissions. I think that's going to have to occur with the existing technology of wind and solar and, and batteries. Batteries are huge. And Lynette, you pointed out that for the first time, I always thought the missing piece in Iowa was solar to go with wind because they go together so well. You know, at night, the uh, wind is often blowing and uh, we need to build out our solar uh, piece, but we'll also need batteries. And so not only are there solar photovoltaic farms uh, being looked at now in Iowa and could provide good income for uh, farmers on marginal lands again. But also there's battery technology for the first time uh, coming in Iowa. And the hope is that we'll be able to recycle uh, Tesla or other batteries uh, to store that wind and solar, that intermittent po power. When the Tesla battery is exhausted, it still can hold 80% of its charge. And we can even use the wind and solar to make hydrogen as our questioner um, uh, advanced. So I think hydrogen does have a future, but maybe not in this immediate 10 years where we, we have to really get going fast. So something perhaps for the um, future careers of your current students to help with that. So, so uh, let, me, let me ask my own final question of each of you as we wrap up today. How would you encourage University of Iowa students and community members, knowing that some of them don't yet have a lot of resources to give back by taking action on climate change? Well, I think, yeah, there's just so much that an individual can do both individually and then working with their organizations. And so, and I just encourage them uh, that we're going to need them. We need everybody behind this, uh, uh, yeah. As the saying goes, I guess, uh, you know, think globally, but act locally. And there's a lot of truth to that. We can all reduce our own carbon footprint uh, and uh, uh, we, we should and we, we will. I also tell my students one of the most important things is to vote. Vote for the um, representatives who believe this to be a problem because it is. The science tells us that it is. And uh, uh, so voting and, and making our democracy work for people is so important to the transition that we're talking about. Well, we have um, our very small way that we are going to um, contribute to that in your honor um, for both Professor Carmichael and Professor Schnorr. In recognition of our thanks for your conversation this afternoon and also your years and decades of dedication and leadership to the University of Iowa, we are going to plant a tree outside the Iowa Advanced Technology Lab, which is the home of what you are referring to as Seeger or the Center for Global and Regional Environmental oh, Research. Fantastic. So uh, as I walk across yeah. campus rather than driving across campus, which I love to do, I will look forward to watching it um, grow and blossom 
for years to come. Oh. And we hope it will be an <laughs> ongoing reminder of the impact that you have yeah. made and continue to make on, on our world. So thank you again, okay. Professor Carmichael and Professor Schnorr. And I will turn it back over to Lucas DeWitt to close our event. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lynette. Um, it's actually reassuring to actually know what is in that building, four years, and I finally figured out what is in that building there. So it's been such a wonderful opportunity to learn uh, this evening, this afternoon. Lynette, thank you for your time in hosting our two professors here today. Um, and President Harold, thank you for your opening remarks. But Professor Carmichael and Professor Schnorr, um, I think you embody what Professor Schnorr said of thinking globally and acting locally, of having the opportunity to interact with University of Iowa students, but also on a global level um, and really bring that here to the Iowa City area and the University of Iowa community. So I want to thank you on behalf of all of our participants um, and everybody involved and just in the Iowa City community for all that you've been doing on campus um, and being a part of this. So thank you so much uh, for all that. And it's been a real pleasure to uh, learn just <laughs> what I can do as a 22 year old communication studies major of uh, some steps that I can take. So thank you for that. Um, and then also many thanks uh, to everybody who joined us this afternoon. Um, this concludes our conversation. So when leaving today, uh, you will be directed to a short survey. Uh, we would appreciate hearing about your experience today, your thoughts on the presentation. Um, we always love uh, getting back feedback from our audience members. I also encourage you to visit foriowa.org to learn more about different upcoming events hosted by the University of Iowa Center for Advancement. Hawkeye Give Back Talks, uh, this happens once a semester, so I encourage you in the future to take part in these wonderful events. Um, but other than that, again, to our panelists, uh, Dr. Carmichael, Dr. Schnorr, Lynette, President Harold, thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. And to our panelists, thank you um, on Iowa and go Hawks. <laughs>